Hi again, everybody, and welcome to the Thunder Bay Community Auditorium. This is a gorgeous facility here in northwestern Ontario. They've had some great artists come through here over the years, and it's the site of uh, a couple of programs that we're going to be doing tonight and tomorrow here in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Some of us are actually old enough to remember when this Lakehead City was two cities. It was Fort William and Port Arthur once upon a time, but in 1970 they merged to become Thunder Bay, and here we are on the spectacularly beautiful shores of Lake Superior. It's been home for thousands of years to the Ojibwe peoples. Thunder Bay's demographics have changed over the centuries. Today's city, like many others in Ontario, sees a resurgence of First Nations and Métis citizens, and that's why we are here tonight, to hear how First Nations and Métis people are managing the opportunities and the challenges of this new and changing reality the first of two programs here in Thunder Bay. Joining us now to set the scene for the discussion, Chief Georgianne Morisot. She is the Chief of the Fort William First Nation. Cynthia Wesley Eskimo. She is Vice Provost of Aboriginal Initiatives at Lakehead University here in Thunder Bay. John Hannum. He is City Clerk of Thunder Bay and Manager of the City of Thunder Bay Aboriginal Liaison Office. And David Paul Achney Paneskum, CEO of Matawa First Nation. And I would ask this audience to welcome our guests here to the community auditorium tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for making time for us tonight to be here. Just to set up our discussion, let's, if we could, Sheldon, bring up these graphics, which will set the scene in terms of the numbers for our discussion to come. Ontario's Aboriginal population, one in six, live on reserve. That's actually down from one in five in 2006. One in two, live in urban Ontario now. The median age is 28. The median age in Canada is 41, so much younger. One in three are under the age of 19. If we look at Canada, Ontario, and Thunder Bay, we see Canada in 2011 with a population of 1.4 million Aboriginal Canadians. That's 4.3% of the total population. In Ontario, a little over 300,000. That represents just almost 2.5%. And in Thunder Bay, 11,000, I'm told these are somewhat controversial numbers, we can get into this in a second, 10% of the current population, census metropolitan area, it is the highest share of Aboriginal people in the total population of Ontario, and projected to rise over the next 15 years or so to 15%. Chief Morso, let me start with you. Uh, tell us about your community and whether they live more on or off reserve. Thank you, Steve. Um, my community is a, uh, a fairly large community. Our membership base is about 2,200, so our membership has also been uh, been increasing quite substantially. Um, we're adjacent to the city of Thunder Bay, therefore that makes us fairly urban, um, both in our practices and customs, but also in how we commute and we um, we grow and how we build our communities and economies on a, on a daily to annual basis. So Fort William has a lot of, uh, we have about 900 on reserve, uh, but the remainder does live off reserve and we're seeing more and more of that as the years go by. So more the majority off reserve. A good majority is off reserve as um, as I said. So having that many of our community members off reserve it definitely does change the dynamics of how we do things in our community and how we try to maintain a lot of our traditional practices and customs but it also opens the gateway and opens the door for our community members to want to reach out beyond the reserve and the confines of the reserve to be able to um, seek uh, whether it's self-sustainable or it's to seek career or to seek education or any kind of goals that they may have down the road um, and, and move beyond that. Well, I was going to ask, how do you keep the culture, the language, the traditions, how do you keep it all going if more and more people are moving into the city and off reserve? Well, I think you can still maintain and I think you can still um, engage in your cultural and traditional practices on reserve and still encourage your off reserve members to participate. Um, again, the teachings kind of go with you wherever you go. So it's a matter of uh, grasping and getting um, our young people, especially our, our parents and families at very young ages to become adaptable to those types of uh, cultural programmings and services. So, again, teachings from elders being very, um, uh, you know, uh, those, those oral histories that are passed down, we kind of take those with us. So whether we're living on reserve or we're living off reserve, it doesn't really matter. It goes with us. But, again, trying to reinvigorate it in a, for an entire community, is there is challenges there because of the urban setting. On whose territory, traditionally speaking, are we now doing this program? We're doing it on Fort William First Nations traditional territory. And I just thought I'd point that out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. David Paul, let's find out about your community. Um, more on reserve, off reserve, how does it work? 
Um, our community, I represent uh, nine First Nations in, uh, in Central North Ontario, and uh, we're called Matawa First Nations. Primarily, uh, I would say uh, the, the majority of the population is a list off reserve. Uh, quite a large uh, population here in Tanabe uh, itself, you know, uh, so we do uh, service quite a lot of uh, our, our citizens here in, actually in Tanabe. Uh, our population wise, it's a, it's a growing population. Uh, we have, uh, I believe, approximately 10,000 people in, in our nine communities. And if people recognize the name Matawa First Nations, it's probably from the Ring of Fire. You're very yeah. involved in that, I presume. Yeah, certainly. Uh, in fact, uh, my, my own community, Martin Falls First Nation, uh, its territory is right, in, uh, right in, uh, within the Ring of Fire. Uh, so it's, uh, it's quite a, you know, an opportunity that we can look forward to. That is a program that we're doing tomorrow night, challenges, opportunities, and so on, on the Ring of Fire. So just to let everybody know about that. John, you've seen the numbers. You've heard the description of the various communities. Um, paint us a picture of how uh, complicated or well things are working out right now. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, certainly the city council and city government have recognized the change in demographics over the last 15, 20, 25 years. You know, the uh, influx of uh, uh, folks from the northern communities and, and neighboring reserves like Fort William and others in uh, uh, northwestern Ontario uh, for either school, uh, health, education, uh, um, opportunities as well as employment has been steady and continual. You pointed out earlier the, uh, the age, median age of the Aboriginal population. Uh, certainly uh, that's much the case here as, as it is across the country. Fastest so, growing demographic yep. in the province, right? So, yep, so a lot, of, a lot of young people, uh, a lot of young families, um, and uh, you know, they're seeking the opportunities that an urban center can offer them. And so that brings uh, uh, you know, challenges for us as a, as a city government in terms of uh, making sure that our services meet their needs. Uh, are delivered in a way that's sensitive to uh, uh, any cultural differences. Uh, and also, you know, we, we look at as a future empl employment opportunity uh, in terms of our workforce. Uh, Can I try and nail down the numbers with you? Because I know if you go online, everybody says 10% Thunder Bay yeah. population Aboriginal. But if you yeah. talk to people in the streets, they tell you 20%. Yeah. What's more accurate? Uh, well, I think, I think that, that, that somewhere between 15 and 20% is the more accurate number. I mean, you simply need to go for a walk down the street and see the faces that are on the street and realize that 10% uh, is, is, is a low number. Uh, you know, participation in the census uh, has always been uh, a bit of a challenge in, the, in First Nations and Aboriginal communities. Um, and so that's you know, part of the reason for uh, a low number coming up on the census. Uh, but you know, we certainly are convinced it's higher. We are, you know, th that's our sort of method of operation is that it's in the 15 to 20% range. Um, and you know, we have a diverse community in terms of you know, European, uh, immigration to this uh, community, uh, but that diversity in terms of the Aboriginal population has been growing steadily, and uh, it's higher than what the census says it is. I got to tell you, again, walking the streets, uh, the European diversity doesn't scream out at me. Oh. I see Finnish. Yeah. I see <laughs> Finland. That's the European diversity yeah. that I see here. Well, it's one of the large, the large communities, and you know, people will tell you we're the largest concentrated expatriate Finnish community outside of Finland. Uh, but there's also a large Italian community, a large uh, Ukrainian and Slavic community, um, and uh, you know a few uh, Anglo-Saxons thrown in there uh, as well. Uh, so it's a mixed bunch. Cynthia, I, first of all, uh, welcome back to the agenda. You're the one guest here who's been on our program many times in the past. Can you start to talk to us about what you believe to be the significance of this increasing prevalence of uh, First Nations and Métis people who are preferring to move off reserve and move to cities and what the implications of that are in your view? Well, the first thing I'd say is it's not necessarily a, pref a preference. I think in, in many instances it's a necessity because they're not, there aren't the jobs available in the communities and the education levels are going up, right? So in 2006, the statistics told us we had about 1,100 PhDs graduated across Canada and about 6,000 master's degrees and about 30,000 undergraduates. In the Aboriginal community? In the Aboriginal community, community across Canada, 70% of them female. Hmm. They need to work and they need to be engaged in the uh, community building at home and external in the urban center. So that's why they're coming because they need to find the work that they need to support their families. So it's not so much a choice as that's it. There are, there are, there are no choices. <clears throat> I think that there's a choice being made 
I mean, it's a choice to move into the city. It's a choice to get an education and go to an urban center to do that. But, you know, depending where we're talking, we're talking about northwestern Ontario. So it's, it's essential that they, they leave the community to go get an education and get work because we haven't been able as a country to build the north appropriately and to give them the schools that they need and give them the economies that they deserve and to build housing that is appropriate to their needs in the north. So it, it's what else can they do? I think that the communities will always be there and the communities, uh, we feel very strongly about maintaining those communities in a good way, but all of Canada has to get behind that. Chief Morso, how successful do you think your community is? I think our community is, uh, is very successful. We're a very f progressive First Nation. I mean, we, um, not only are we strategically located here, we're y the gateway essentially to the north um, in terms of economic development and sustainability. Um, so we tend to capitalize on that. But we also have a very dynamic community in the sense that we, our education rates are, inc they're, they're, right. they're going up, they're rising. And that's, that's a very good thing. I mean, we just recently had a doctor graduate from our community. So that's, that speaks in volumes and that shows the level of capacity that our community is now working at. Um, you know, they're, they're more susceptible to, um, you know, a greater vision of long-term success and long-term economic viability. And they're willing to now engage and participate um, both on reserve, but in the federal landscape and in the, and in the northwestern landscape here in Ontario. So that to me says a lot. And again, it shows that our communities are becoming a lot more progressive and they're becoming a lot more engaged in wanting to participate both on reserve, but also in the broader scheme. Let me... Um let me get a little more in your face on this one, okay? Absolutely. We were here on the weekend. We facilitated a discussion about um, difficult issues around discrimination and racism mm -hmm. between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal populations. On this stage, we had this discussion. And I got to hand it to people. They spoke uh, passionately, emotionally, mm -hmm. brilliantly, uh, candidly about the way things are. And I... D I I hear what you're saying on the issue of success. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of stereotypes out there about Aboriginal Canadians as well. What are you seeing on that front? There is, I mean, and there's a lot of stigma, stigmas attached to the First Nation and Aboriginal community. Um, but I think it's important to understand when we talk about race relations, uh, race relations doesn't just mean between the Indian and the white. And I think that's, if you want to be candid about it, I think that's kind of where we end up starting these conversations. And it's almost shooting yourself in the foot to begin with. So it's understanding that we all participate in the greater north. It's understanding that it's not just about me and you, it's about everybody. And it's understanding and being able to put action to these words of how do we address that? How do we move beyond that? Well, we move beyond it by participating. We move beyond it by taking a lot of these race relation issues and we start educating. We start providing the outlets for people to understand the significant relationship between the First Nation people in Canada, but also how do we work together? And wh what's the goal? Is the goal to achieve a greater economy, a greater success, greater relationships, greater partnerships? With partnerships comes opportunity, and we know that. So we're not going to have those successful partnerships if we continue to look at the facial surface, if we continue to racially profile one another, if we continue to hang on to these stereotypes that we know, for large in part, are not accurate. Uh, I'm, thank you for teasing. Applause in the background there. We are going to come back to that issue, but I want to pick up on the issue of economic success as well. And David Paul, again, in your community, how much, I, I mean, I have to tell you, south of the French River, most of what we hear about what happens in northern Ontario is economic bad news. That's most of what we hear. How accurate is that? Well, I think uh, right now the, uh, the market is, uh, is down, but I think for us it's an opportunity for, uh, for our people and uh, our communities and our leadership to to, to get ready. Uh, we have been undertaking a lot of uh, preparedness uh, with our people ourselves in terms of understanding, uh, you know, the, the mining industry itself. It's uh, getting them involved and, uh, and also uh, uh, preparing them for a job and business opportunities. Certainly, uh, those things are uh, fairly new to our people where the, uh, the unemployment rate in our communities is up to 90, 95% in, in our community. So, so to get our people involved is uh, itself a challenge, but certainly, um, you know, uh, I believe that through uh, through uh, through training, uh, awareness, and uh, and also um, talk about education, getting our, our young people are uh, interested in uh, uh, furthering their uh, furthering their uh, uh, academic level. We have seen uh, 
great strides uh, within our communities, uh, people graduating from uh, institutions, whether it's college or university. They have uh, doctor degrees, uh, you know, lawyers and uh, engineering, et cetera, and we want to see more of that. I have to follow up on that number yeah. you just said a second ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, 90 to 95 percent unemployment rates is a disaster. That is, that is a tragedy. What's happening to try to train, educate, change that situation right now? Well, um, I mean, the unemployment rate is primarily your, um, you know, just to uh, let you know, the, uh, the primary employer in, in our, some of our remote communities is uh, the First Nation administration. Hmm. And that, that's about it. Maybe you have a, a store or a health center, but... So uh, the 90 to 95% yeah, you're talking yeah. about is an on-reserve number. Yeah, yeah, on-reserve. And, uh, mm -hmm. but certainly uh, uh, when you're a question in terms of uh, is it a, dis a disaster, I would say no. I think uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the mining industry itself, to, uh, we're certainly in discussions with, uh, with Ontario in terms of uh, our involvement in the, uh, in, in the future uh, opportunities uh, through the, the Ontario Regional Framework. I'm sure that's uh, been discussed in, uh, previously, but certainly uh, uh, we see that as uh, an opportunity for, for the future of our, uh, of our people and our okay. First Nations. If that's the on-reserve unemployment numbers, John, do you have some better sense about what it, the Aboriginal unemployment rate in the city is, off-reserves? Uh, the Aboriginal specifically, no. Uh, I mean, our overall uh, unemployment rate's around 6%. Uh, 6.2, I think, is the number that leaps to mind most recently. But um, I'm hearing it's almost 20%. Does that ring true? That that could well be. Yeah. Um, What's the city doing to do something about that? Well, part of it, uh, I guess, what we're doing is, is through the strategy that we developed uh, through our Urban Aboriginal uh, Liaison mm -hmm. Office, the strategy that has four pillars to it. You know, what's the city's role as a service provider, uh, as a, as a partner? Uh, and then the key one here is as an employer, what, you know, what's our role as an employer? So we're working to ensure, uh, first off, that the application process uh, for jobs with the city itself um, uh, is ec an equitable one, that there isn't systemic uh, uh, discrimination uh, in the um, uh, hiring process. And we've gone through some exercises uh, to try to ensure that that is the case. And we're, you know, we're reasonably satisfied that that's the case now, but it you know, needs to be continually uh, uh, watched. Um, looking at what uh, participation we can have in local job fairs in conjunction with uh, Confederation College and Lakehead University and with the high schools uh, to make uh, folks in the community, uh, you know, from, from the Aboriginal uh, part of the community aware of what the opportunities for employment at the city are. You know, we, we're a large employer, there's a wide range of jobs uh, that the city needs to fill on an ongoing basis and uh, making sure that the young people are aware of what those jobs are, what the educational requirements are for them, uh, and uh, you know, all of them can be satisfied uh, right here at home. Can I follow up on that? Do you, do you, are there jobs that are going unfilled that you would like to see young Aboriginal people have, but they don't have the education to fill those jobs? Well, the ones that are always a challenge for us, given our geographic isolation, are uh, ones that, you know, the, the so-called professional jobs, like engineers and, and planners and, uh, you know, legal uh, staff. Uh, those are the ones that are often a challenge to fill because, the, you know, the job opportunities in southern Ontario are sometimes more attractive. People are, you know, that's where the population is. People have families. So attracting people to, to work in the north that aren't from here, uh, you know, is sometimes difficult. And so those are the ones where, you know, we have the hardest time uh, filling those positions. Uh, but even, you know, you hear stories all the time, the community about even filling truck driving positions is a challenge. Hmm. We can't find enough people with, uh, you know, with those qualifications. Uh, but, you know, we have tradespeople as well. And, uh, uh, you know, a range of employment is, is available here. And it's our role to make sure that we get that message out there and, and provide the supports in terms of directing people to the, the education resources so that they can fill our future employment needs. Cynthia, if I heard John correctly, he said he's relatively convinced that the city is doing its utmost to make sure that jobs without people, people without jobs, to try and make those things happen together. Are you as convinced? <clears throat> well, I know that there's some difficulties. I know that uh, a lot of, because I work at the university, I'm at Lakehead and I get to talk to a lot of young people, they seem to feel that there's still a fair level of discrimination, that they can go out and go through the entire city and give out the resumes and not get any uptake on those resumes or get any callbacks so that they could get interviews. One girl said her mother told her to change her last name. 
you know, so you can get your foot in the door and actually go in and get an interview so that they don't know that you're native before you get there. Um, but I also want to talk about that whole question around economy in the city. I mean, Lakehead has done some uh, research on, on what's going on with the city in the economy and what Indigenous peoples bring into the city. And Poise for Growth, <laughs> Poise for Development shows that, in fact, the Aboriginal population coming into the city, because, the, you know, there's quite a bit of back and forth to the communities in the north, that, uh, that they, they, they bring in almost $400 million per annum. They bring in money for hotels, accommodation, for meeting spaces. They do their shopping here. We have three or four Walmarts in Thunder Bay, <laughs> you know, to accommodate that. You know, there's a lot of resources coming in because there's nothing that sticks necessarily to the reserves themselves. Because, uh, you know, as David Paul said, there's, there's maybe a little store. So the money hasn't got anything to stick to. So they spend their money in, in, in urban centers like Thunder Bay, Winnipeg, Timmins, and resources c flow. So the idea that Aboriginal community is not contributing anything isn't, isn't correct. And, you know, we've had this conversation about employment before. I mean, maybe in, this, in the reserves they're not employed, you know, sitting at a, at a computer and doing, you know, typing some reports, but they're, but they're actually actively engaged with supporting their families. They're on the land. You know, they're, they're, they're making sure that their homes have heat. They're doing other kinds of things that actually mm -hmm. keep them employed. You know, maybe not for cash economy, but land-based economies, which are a totally different thing and are essential in the North for survival. So what's the biggest obstacle to success right now? I think part of the, the, the problem down here is, uh, is, is education and getting them into the education system. We have to be innovative and creative, and we're not necessarily so. Because people are coming out of communities with 30 years of experience doing social services work. We're insisting that, that they get an MSW before they continue. And why can't we be more innovative so that they can get that certification that they need so that they can go r immediately back mm. into their communities and do the work that's essential there? So we're, we're being, we're sort of, impo again, imposing our values in the North and our, and our ideals on, onto the North and saying, you have to be like us if you're going to be successful. And frankly, mm. we've seen 600 years of that and it hasn't been very successful at all. So I think that if we're not prepared to be innovative, if we're not prepared to be inclusive, if we're not prepared to change the way we see the indigenous population in this country, which is, by the way, isn't going anywhere. It's growing rapidly. And it's all, I mean, if you went to the Inspire Awards, you see thousands of, of talented, beautiful, engaged, hardworking, employed young Aboriginal people and older Aboriginal people. So it's just, we have to see that. We have to, the, the country needs to see that. Take 20 seconds, tell people what the Inspire Awards are. The Inspire Awards are, the, uh, are, are through uh, Roberta Jameson Shop and they, they give money, millions of dollars per annum, to Aboriginal st uh, students across Canada so that they can attend college, universities, and other kinds of institutions. And they are graduating a tremendous number of, of students every year. Chief Morso, what's the biggest obstacle to success right now in your view? <sighs> oh, okay, well, I think uh, when I look at the, the obstacle to success, I think is, first of all, it's how we perceive success, individual level, at the community level, and then at the regional level. And I think it's understanding what our, our potential is. I always say that you have to realize your own potential to see the success beyond that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it becomes our responsibilities within our First Nations to be able to foster that and to be able to provide the outlets, the necessary outlets that our First Nation kids require, and even our First Nation families, to be able to to see what their true potential is. And I mean, whether it's through education, whether it's through d various workshops, whether it's through you know, different support services to be put in place, I think that's where it starts. It starts at home and it's, it's essential to have um, a good quality of life. So how do we promote a good quality of life? One that's healthy and one that fosters and promotes healthy families and healthy kids. And w you know, once, once you put those tools in place, I mean, there's the stepping to stones to success and it's to ensure that you know, at our level too, at the leadership level, that we continue to pursue that and we continue to promote that and help our people see beyond you know today or see beyond our nose like we have to look 10 15 20 50 years down the road we can't just look at here now and today david paul same question how would you answer that biggest obstacle to your succeeding right now our biggest obstacle uh, when our people come to the city to to seek uh, employment or uh, other opportunities it's a uh, it's a thematic uh, racism that's, uh, that's facing our people. It's, for them, they don't know how to handle that. Uh, it's, there are a lot of them uh, give up in despair and just go back home and, you know, sit, we don't want to uh, have to deal with that. But, but I believe that uh, uh, that obstacle can be overcome in a, in a lot of ways. And we've, uh, Matawa, have uh, worked with our people tr 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 on the transitional uh, terms, you know, in terms of uh, uh, getting them used to how to navigate uh, the resources that are available, how to, uh, 
you know, uh, work with the resources that uh, that we have in uh, in our uh, there is plenty of resources out there. I think it's just a matter of knowing where where you can get those resources. But certainly, uh, you know, that obstacle uh, to one way or the other has to be uh, overcome. But certainly, it's uh, it's not a challenge that uh, you know that that's going to be there forever. I think uh, a lot of people are have have overcome that, uh, including myself. You know, and uh, it's just that we all we all in it this together. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to work with each other, and we have to learn from each other and build awareness about each other. I must say, I think we saw a lot of that on the stage here the other night. It was a very impressive discussion, which will be on our website, and people can check that out if they want to. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just take a minute pause here, because we've got some tape we want to show everybody. Uh, David Irwin is one of our producers back in Toronto, and he went out with his camera and um, took some pictures and tried to get a better understanding of the life of young First Nations and Métis people here in Thunder Bay, those who are here and who have come here. So we're going to play that tape and then we'll come back and talk. It's actually not tape. I don't know why I keep saying tape. We don't have videotape anymore. It's all digital. Anyway, roll that digital thing if you would, Sheldon. My reserve, I think the population would be about 1,200. And when we got here, it was actually really different compared to being in the reserve. These kids are coming to Thunder Bay. Uh, they experience disorientation. They don't know where anything is. They're away from their families, most of them for the first time and you're a boarding student, meaning uh, you left the community to go to high school, um, you're probably not staying with a family that you know, you're probably staying with strangers. So these kids are coming to Thunder Bay with a whole host of issues that they may not have dealt with. And you're coming from a small community, uh, most of them are, you know, you, could, you, you know everybody in the community. You're related to half the, half the community. So when you come to a place like Thunder Bay, it's uh, overwhelming. Well, that's a beautiful shot of the city of Thunder Bay. We are here in the Thunder Bay Community Auditorium. Our producers are holding a live Twitter chat right now. So if you want to weigh in on the subject we're discussing tonight, you can share your thoughts using the hashtag AgendaTVO. Let's welcome two new people to our conversation right now. Jonathan Kakigamek is the principal at the Dennis Franklin Cromarty High School, and Samantha Crow is here. She is called a Youth Amplifier with Feathers of Hope. That's a First Nations youth group-led initiative supported by Ontario's Office of the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth. And how about a warm Thunder Bay welcome for these two new guests on our program. Uh, Jonathan, to you first. Why do kids come to Thunder Bay to go to high school? I think the main reason is that uh, the 23 First Nation communities that I serve, our school, they have no high school. Um, no high school on any of the 23? Well, the larger ones have up to grade 9, and I think there's two that have up to grade 10. So after that, they need to go somewhere. What do you think of that situation? Well, it, I don't like it personally. It's, it's tragic because each community loses a good chunk for the whole school year. And that does something to a community on top of what all else has been discussed. Once and they leave to go to high school in the city, are they gone for good? Oh, they, they, they come out uh, end of August, then they're with us until mid-May. So that's nine months of the whole school year that they're out here for school. What does that do to the community back home? Well, I can't imagine that, that probably there's an empty feeling. Because in our traditional ways, every group had a role in the community to uh, make the community survive. And like with, in our school, we have elders program. And in each community, the elders, with all their vast knowledge, they're passing that every day to the youth. But that's not there because they're out here. So there is something that's missing every year. And it's difficult to grow and become stronger with that missing part. Tell us about your school. How many kids? Well, we have about 120 students. We usually start off with 150 every year. And, and what we, happens? We lose them to health and safety and uh, homesickness. So uh, they go home. And they're home till another year. So when you're 16 and you go home because you're homesick, you lose one year of school. And that does something to a young teenager, 
because that's a huge period of time that they're not really doing nothing. And so much could happen in that year at home. So they go home, there's no education, right? There's no school back home? Well, there's limited, uh, there's limited programs, but you cannot replace a classroom. Mm -hmm. The interaction with the teacher and with all the resources that a uh, high school could bring. And presumably if they go home, there's certainly not no. a job waiting for them there. It's more difficult. Yeah. yeah. Makes your life tricky, eh? Yeah, yeah it's good. but it's good work though. I believe in it. Hmm. Do you think you're making a difference? As a school, I do. How so? Well, we're uh, creating an identity in our youth because when they're with us, they don't have their mom and dad with them to tell them that they're loved or ask them about their day. Things that families across Canada take granted for. So we try to, well, we could never replace a mother's love and a dad's love, but we do our best with our staff and with the programs. And, uh, you know, it takes time to build success. It doesn't happen overnight. Where do your students live? Well, they're built up throughout the city in uh, homes that people that want to help. And even then, that, that's the transition there mm -hmm. because uh, there's different rules for every home. And most of the times of our homes up north is very relaxed and people come and go and we share. So there's a transition for our students, but even for transportation. Like our school, we don't have school buses. They have to come to school on the city transit. Mm -hmm. So that's huge. And I think the tenant's first period is probably around 70 percent and I, that's awesome because you have a 15 year old first time out in the city taking a city transit bus hmm. and it gets pretty cool up here in the <laughs> winters. When um, the students are billeted with other families are they usually aboriginal families? It's about half and half and just like any any program there's strong boarding homes and those are the students that succeed when they have a good boarding home. Do they, are they more likely to succeed if they're with an Aboriginal family as opposed to a non-Aboriginal family? Not, not necessarily. It all depends on the home and how they are connected to each other. Hmm. Do their families ever come with them? Yes, more and more. Like uh, past five years, I've been taking students up to 10 that I don't get no tuition for because the parents are starting to see that they need to support their, their young ones. And uh, so they do move out. And... Uh, Sometimes a mom or sometimes a dad and they, or they take turns and they support their kid in high school. Hmm. Okay, Jonathan, thank you for that. Okay. Samantha, you are a youth amplifier. So the first question I've got to ask you is what the heck is that? Right. So a youth amplifier, my job is really to amplify the voices of young people. So my whole role is to make sure that the voices of young people are being heard by everyone. How do you do that? It's really listening to exactly what the young people have to say, their issues and their recommendations, and saying it to as many people who have to hear it and who don't want to hear it, to make sure that everyone gets to hear what people's realities really are. Now, I met you over the weekend because you participated in that discussion about discrimination that we had. Mm -hmm. So I know you're 21, right? Yes. Part-time student? Uh, Full-time student. Full-time student. Yes. Okay. Where are you going and what are you doing? Uh, so I'm a Lakehead University student. Uh, I'm taking social work with a concentration of Indigenous learning. So my goal is to keep d working within the North because my passion is working for young people and making sure that their rights and their needs are being served. Your First Nation? Yes. Which one? Uh, so I'm Ojibwe and I come from Lake Helen First Nations. So it's always not really the first thing that comes to mind when people look at me. And so I want to make sure that people don't have these preconceived notions of what a First Nations person is, who they look like, what they act, all sorts of things. You speak Ojibwe? Uh, unfortunately, I do not. So that's one of the things that ha has happened over the years, that losing your culture and losing your identity, you lose some things within the transition. So myself and my family, we're, we're trying to gain that knowledge back. We're trying to be a part of our culture and learn more of our traditions. Can you give us a greater sense? I think that Jonathan did a great job on it, but you're a little closer to the age of those who actually, maybe at the age of 14, leave a reserve and come to the bigger city and try mm -hmm. to make a go of it. What's that like? I think people don't understand how much young First Nations people really struggle. So in, like, in general, First Nations people, they're more likely to be within uh, the child welfare system. There's higher incarceration rates. Uh, there's more mental health issues. So uh, young First Nations people are five to seven more times to commit suicide. Like there's a whole 
wrath of issues that young people have to face at such an early age. And if they're going to be in school without a support system, that makes everything so much more worse. And so imagine trying to learn in a new environment that's not welcoming, but then also trying to combat all the racism and discrimination and everything else that comes with a new territory. You said not welcoming. Is the environment not welcoming? I think a lot of people try to make it welcoming, but there is a greater sense that unless you have that support system, unless you have that great circle of friends that can help you and be there for you, it can be really difficult to transition. Hmm. Talk to us about that transition. What's the hardest part about it? I think just leaving your family. I don't know if people can even imagine. You're 13 or 14 years old. You're leaving everything that you know to try and get an education that everyone else in Canada takes for granted. You leave your home, you leave your culture, you leave your identity to be something that other people are wanting you to be, to have that education, to move forward. Because today in Western culture, you need that education in order to move forward. Well, the, um, I guess the other example, that I mean, it's not remotely close to it, but, for example, if you're a fantastic hockey player and you end up leaving your hometown and billeting with another family, place away, I remember Wayne Gretzky talking about how homesick he was when he had to leave home and go do that. But, of course, he's not moving into a completely different cultural setting. Exactly. So how complicated is that transition? Exactly. So it's one thing to be moving away from your home, but it's a completely different thing when you're, you're leaving your way of life, you're leaving everything that you have once known, that you're completely normalized to that that is who you are and how you live your life and so when you transition from being who you are and being with people who you're comfortable with and who practice your culture and your traditions and your lifestyle to going to someone to maybe someone who doesn't understand your culture who doesn't understand your lifestyle and aren't supportive so how can you have a healthy relationship how can you have a healthy self-esteem and know who you are and have a better place of where you're going if you don't have that support if you don't have somebody to be there with you to relate with you and to grow with you hmm. jonathan let's figure out how well this works when you get young people from the reserve coming to your high school what percentage would you say graduate from high school well, we, we usually have about end the year with about 120 students and we usually have a graduating class of about 25 every year. Hmm. So to me, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay. And what happens to them after they leave your school? Well, they, some state go home and some go to college, but that's a different ball game. Right. What percentage do you think go on for further post-secondary? Probably uh, half. Okay. So and that half has got a, I mean, pretty good shot at a job yes. afterwards then? Yeah. Like we've been open for 13 years. This year, we're going to have six students that are graduating from Lakehead University. So that's success there, and it takes commitment. Applause, applause. Yeah. <clears throat> Is that but, your experience? Uh, no. So I've lived most of my life in Thunder Bay, so I didn't have to experience that transition. I was lucky to have a support system at home. Uh, if I didn't have that support system, if I didn't have caring friends and a loving family, I pr could probably be one of the stats that so many First Nations people unfortunately fall to. How do we create more of that? Well, not everyone's meant to go to college or university. And uh, I think our leaders are starting to realize that. Uh, at DFC, we've been working on a trade school. And we opened up for the, this year, officially. And this trade school, our students are actually going to have the red ticket. What's that? It's a, it's a certificate that you're qualified to do trades across Canada whether it's plumbing or welding or auto mechanics. It's not the programs that usually is done up north where they get a certificate, but companies across Canada doesn't recognize that. So this is the real deal for our students. And we have the unions in this region that are supporting that, and they're ready to take our grade 12s when they graduate, just right into the apprenticeship. Okay, so the half that graduate from your school and do go on to do some kind of post-secondary or do get the red ticket, yeah. they're, is it fair to say they're sort of on their way? Yes, if they, if they, uh, yeah, and if we keep supporting them, because with this trade school, we're going to monitor them each year with the grade nines and we're going to keep improving our programming. Okay, so what support. happens to the other half, Jonathan? I don't know. Like, uh, look, there's a lot of issues, too, that, that comes into play, personal issues, family issues, and... Uh, Sometimes all the help that we could offer is not enough. Hmm. I think that's a sad reality. Samantha, I want to ask you about one of the numbers we heard off the top of the program. I think it was one in three First Nations people are under the age of 19, mm -hmm. younger than you even. 
Do you think youth are finding a new voice or a new sense of power in those numbers? I think uh, despite all the hardships and the struggles that young, pe young First Nations people face, there's a growing movement of empowerment, of wanting to have their voice heard, of creating awesome and powerful change within their communities, but also within their urban communities as well. First Nations people are doing wonderful and amazing things. And so we want to always make sure that we acknowledge all the positive stories and all the su successful stories because that's what's going to bring people forward. To see that other people are doing great things, you can realize that you don't have to be stuck and that you're not powerless, that you can move forward and do greater things for your community. I mean, it, it's understandably, I think, because media like to shine the light on problems in the hopes that they can be solved. But what it means is, of course, we hear a lot of bad news stories. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're on the ground here. You tell us, is the story better than what we're hearing? Or is it as accurate as what we're hearing? Or what's your sense of it? I think it depends on every community and every situation. And there's no one situation that's alike. I think there's definitely uh, struggles and hardships that need to be faced because they're not being addressed fully. Mm -hmm. But there, we want to also ma really make sure that we're acknowledging all the success stories and all the positive things that's happening because if we're only focusing on the negative, people won't hear that people are moving forward and creating wonderful, wonderful uh, programs and initiatives and whatever else to bring uh, themselves, their families and their communities forward. So at the end of the day, as a youth amplifier, as your title is, what do you want to see happen? At the end of the day, I want to make sure that young people, no matter where they are, whether they're in a community or not, that they're safe, that they're healthy, that they're happy, that they have the same equal opportunity to learn and to grow, to play, because you don't really get, get you, know, you don't always get that experience. And it's sad to say because someone's childhood comp could be completely different than someone else's within Canada, and it shouldn't be that different. We're in the same country, we have the same laws, we have the same, we should have the same, uh, fortunes for to receive resources and services and things like that, but that's not the case. Samantha, Jonathan, it's awfully good of you to join us at the community auditorium tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, very good. Okay, we are going to get back to our discussion now with Chief George Ann Morisot, the Chief of the Fort William First Nation, on whose traditional land we now find ourselves tonight. Cynthia Wesley Eskimo, the Vice Provost at Lakehead University. John Hannum, the City Clerk of Thunder Bay and the Manager of the City of Thunder Bay Aboriginal Liaison Office, and David Paul Achni Paneskum, the CEO of Matawa First Nations. I would just be interested in your reaction to what you just heard. Cynthia, wow, wow. fire away. I was like, yes, tell it, girl. Because <laughs> that's the way it is. I mean, I really believe that. I mean, you know, I've been running an organization for kids across Canada for six years, and we just came back from 300 kids, native, non-native, all together, all talking about how do we do reconciliation in this country? How do we make this a place to live in the future for everybody equally and in a good way? So I think the kids are the, the, kids are the ones that got it, and we have to support them, and we have to be a part of their lives, and we have to talk to them, and we have to listen to what they have to say. John, anything you want to pick up on? Well, I, absolutely. Samantha's the, the kind of young person that, that our community needs, that every community needs. And, uh, you know, her empathy and her compassion and her obviously her hard work and, uh, and passion for what she's doing is the kind of thing that uh, we'd like to see in our community. We know well, there's lots of young people like her mm -hmm. here. I mean, uh, I have a few that are a bit older than, than <laughs> uh, Samantha already working for the city, and, and we see the, the contribution they can make, uh, you know, to the city, city government side of things, but also out in, in many of the private sectors. So we need more people like Samantha to step up and, and take their place. And Jonathan, too. And Jonathan, <laughs> too. <laughs> Your reaction, Chief, to what you just heard? Uh, likewise, I mean, I agree, and I have to say that people like Samantha and both Jonathan, you know, those are the champions that are the champions of change, and they're the ones that are encouraging our emerging, young emerging leaders to step forward and, you know, really empower others, empower their peers, work with their with other young people to want to focus on the solution as opposed to always focusing on the doom and gloom problems that we have as First Nation people. So, you know, looking at feathers of hope and also looking at what Jonathan's been, uh, you know, been doing over at DFC, again, you see the success is coming out of those stories and I mean when they they might be small successes but they're still a success and young people having those outlets it uh, it means a great deal and it does um, it does foster that that uh, sense of nurture and that sense of identity I think moving forward so should we play this clip a apropos of what the chief just said should we play this clip now you want to do this Sheldon okay let's do that here's a uh, Karen uh, here's Karen Perry from our discussion the other night 
Uh, this was a really interesting meetup. We talked about racism, discrimination, Aboriginal versus non-Aboriginal communities, how everybody can, one hopes in the future, live together in greater harmony. Roll tape, please. Racism is rampant in Thunder Bay. It's very, very healthy. Um, when I was younger, it wasn't, it was always there, of course, but uh, because maybe the Fort William First Nation kind of stuck to themselves over there and they came out once in a while to West Fort and so forth, it wasn't so bad. But now we have a lot of Native people in Thunder Bay and, and uh, you know, when you go to the store, they know you're Indian and they, you certainly get the diff different treatment. But you know what, I'm used to it. I really don't give a damn. David Paul, the expression we heard there was racism was alive and well in Thunder Bay. Is that your experience too? Yeah, certainly so. Unfortunately, it is. Uh, we find that when we, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, an organization that uh, we provide training uh, to, to, our, to uh, our young people that had dropped out of high school uh, at some point in time, and we want to get them to, uh, to uh, continue on with their academics. And I'm glad to say that uh, we have graduated uh, you know, close to 400 uh, young people. So uh, it's really great to see that. But then we also have uh, people that go to trades uh, and want to continue on to uh, take those opportunities. But unfortunately, we have a hard time to try to place those people uh, with employment uh, uh, businesses or even uh, try to place them uh, with the unions and work with the unions as well. So the real story right now is that it, it's, uh, it's, it's challenging to, uh, to try to place our people that have these skills, uh, trained skills, uh, to be recognized uh, and, and give them these opportunities. I mean, that's the reality. And, uh, you know, and, but we have to work at it, continue to work at it. We're not giving up. And, Certainly our students and our clients haven't given up either, so. Uh, well, I want to hear how you do that. And John, and John, believe it or not, we didn't invite you on this program tonight to be the villain or the heavy or whatever. <laughs> but having said that, um, you represent the city. There has been, not just in this city, but all over the country, obviously, uh, hundreds if not longer years of um, mistrust, of unhappiness among the two peoples. Um, what do you think can be done to reset the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians? Uh, well, uh, it needs deliberate work, and that's where we set out, um, you know, eight years ago now, when the city uh, uh, decided to uh, pursue an, an, what we called at that point an urban Aboriginal strategy. Um, you know, I, I presented to council that it, it was based on relationships, that, that moving this forward needed to be a relationship-based effort. So on an individual basis, on a relationship with agencies and organizations that provide services in the community, and on a political relationship level with, uh, you know, Chief Morriso and Fort William First Nation and Bandon Council, as well as with uh, tribal councils like Matawa and, and, and NAN as a political organization as well. You so should not be asking Asian. Nation, yes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've worked uh, in the community, um, uh, within the corporation of the city of Thunder Bay in terms of the relationship with service providers and agencies, and as well as the political that are to build those relationships. Because uh, it's that mistrust um, that uh, you know, has been supported so well uh, for so long uh, that we're trying to overcome. And so Chief it's a person to person uh, that, that we're fighting that one step at a time. Chief Moore, so one of the things, I mean, we heard today, Cynthia, you said it, change your last name, you might have a better shot at getting a job. We heard in the discussion that we had on the weekend, uh, somebody saying that when they present their status card, which enables them to purchase things tax-free, mm -hmm. uh, the clerk behind the cash register rolled her eyes as if to say, oh, here we go again. Uh, how do you reset this relationship so there's less of that? Well, I, I just touching a little bit on what, uh, what John was saying earlier is, um, it is it is a relationship building exercise and it's uh, be able, being able to break the barriers of trust that stand in our way. And, you know, um, a lot of the times I think it's a lot of these misperceptions or these stigmas that are attached to First Nation people as though we're the burden of society. And we're really not. I mean, as uh, Cynthia or, or one of the panelists said earlier that we do contribute to society. We contribute a great deal to society and the economy. So we have to, people have to stop looking at us as though we're just the burdens walking into Walmart and just flashing our status card as if we have these superior rights. Well, we don't. 
it's, that's not, doesn't work that way. I mean, and there's a lot of history that makes up for why we are where we are today and why we have the certain status and the levels that we, uh, that we have to deal with. Um, but just touching back on the, the, the partnerships and how we move forward together and, and ensure that we're doing what we have to do, we have to take a level of responsibility. Um, the city has programs that are, that are available and they're start trying to work. They have the urban Aboriginal strategy, but in order for that to work, us as political leaders ourselves, us as chiefs, we need to come forward and we need to really put our money where our mouth is and start saying, we're going to take responsibility for our own problems and our own people. And we want to contribute to that. I mean, we're not just sitting back as people may think either, not doing anything or kind of waiting and holding our hands out. We don't do that. We're willing to contribute. We're willing to come forward and we're willing to take care of our own and we're willing to invest in that. And I think that needs to be talked about a little bit more often. And I, I think that we as, as chiefs or as political leaders need to step forward and really show that we're willing to do that. Yeah. Cynthia, it might be useful here. Just to, We have a lot of new Canadians who watch this program mm. yes. who may not understand the whole phenomenon of what a status card is or what it enables you to do or not to do. Or Can you give us the 30-second history lesson on what that's all about? <laughs> <laughs> 30 seconds. Status 30 card seconds. Is, our, is, is, is just a federal recognition of, of your birth as, a, as an Indigenous person in, on this land. And if you're recognized by the federal government, uh, you know, both parents are Aboriginal or at least one of them, you get a card saying, yes, you are an Indian under the Indian Act, which was enacted in 1876. So it's an antiquated piece of legislation, still standing, still in place, but there is recognition and, that, and it's kind of a symbiotic relationship between Canada and First Nations peoples to have that card. The, the Métis don't have a card like that nor do uh, um, non-status peoples. So. And therefore when you go shopping you present that card it, and? It, okay so the status card actually exempts you from the post uh, <laughs> post-traumatic stress. <laughs> 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 I don't think kind it of associated that. to that <laughs> <Yeah>. from, uh, <laughs> from the uh, PST. So we pay the GST, <laughs> but we don't. The yeah. harmonized sales tax. Yes exactly. Well half of, it, half of it. Half of it. We only pay, we, it's not the whole thing. We pay the HST. Okay. So which uh, you, you so it's uh, I guess it's uh, we pay the five percent. So not and the we get the eight percent is off. The provincial sales tax right. you don't have to pay. Right. Okay. And wh why is that? I mean, I, I found it interesting because that people made a big deal of the fact that that w this entitlement, which has existed for such a long time, is such a point of controversy with so well, many people. Because it creates what people see as a difference that isn't that doesn't feel fair in this day and age. But the point of it is it goes back to the whole question of treaties and land session agreements and the idea that we have our own governments, you have your own governments, we will not interfere with your governments, please do not interfere with ours and you will not tax us because we will not be taxing you. So there's two different kinds of equations that are part of that conversation and it's a long history. So we have to start the conversation. We all have to have a conversation, make friends, be allies, and educate each other about uh, each other so that we, we can work together. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm happy to help. Just give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> Chief, I've heard it described that this rapprochement will happen one interaction at a time. Mm -hmm. Can it really be that simple? I think uh, change starts with one. I really do. I believe that. And I think that as we continue to move on again, when we listen to this young woman over here talk about being a, a champion, so to speak, I mean, it, it does really start with one. And I think it's going to take time. We know that. Um, but I think if we start to recognize not only our challenges and start focusing on the successes and focusing on solution based approaches, I think anything's possible. And I mean, as cliche as that might sound, it really is. And, you know, we're, we're such resilient people as First Nation people and as Aboriginal people in Canada. I mean, we've been through a plethora of atrocities over the course of history, but yet we still strand, stand stronger today than we ever have. So it's being able to recognize that and teach our young people that, you know what, you do have a future in this country. Your, this country is equally yours as it is anyone else's. And it's being able to show them that they can reach for the stars. Mm -hmm. Nice. I think reaching for the stars is a good spot to leave this conversation. <laughs> I want to thank all four of you for coming in tonight to the community auditorium and helping us out with this. Can we thank Chief George Ann Morisot, the Chief of the Fort William First Nation, on whose traditional land we now do this program. Cynthia Wesley Eskimo, the Vice Provost, Aboriginal Initiatives at Lakehead University. John Hannum, the City Clerk of Thunder Bay and the Manager of the City of Thunder Bay Aboriginal Liaison Office, and David Paul Achney Paneskin, the CEO of Matawa First Nation. It's great to have all of you on our program tonight here in Thunder Bay. Thank you so much for joining us. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.